Well, good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It's nice that you're able to join us here this evening. And I know others will be joining us as the evening progresses. Um, and as you can see on your screen, we're going to be reading the 23rd presentation of A.T. Jones from the 1893 General Conference Bulletin. But before we begin reading, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the Sabbath and for the blessings of this past week, including the trials that we have faced, the disappointments we have experienced, and the burdens that we feel for those around us. But we know, Lord, that um, we can come before you, where two or three are gathered, and we can feel your presence and experience your comfort. We know, Lord, that um, you need us to submit our hearts to you, and we need you uh, to take our hearts and to use them as you see fit. And we know, Lord, that we are reluctant at times to give up the things of this world because we imagine them uh, to be of more value than your kingdom. We ask for forgiveness. We ask, Lord, that, that you can take our hearts, that you can use us to your glory. We pray for each person. We know the struggles that we face in our lives, but we may not be able to appreciate what others go through, but we know they are real. And um, we pray for those that are suffering in various ways. Help us to minister to those around us that you can direct us um, and give us a, uh, an insight that we lack when it comes to how we see the world. Help us to see things as Jesus uh, sees things. We thank you, Lord, for this message from A.T. Jones. As we read this together, Lord, I ask that um, your Holy Spirit can enlighten our minds, that we can see the applications to our time, to our own life, and that they will encourage each person who is watching this video. Be with them. Be with all who are searching for truth. May you use us, if at all possible, um, to, to minister to them. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good evening again. Happy Sabbath. Um, so we've been go going through reading these presentations of A.T. Jones. And they've been very powerful, even though, you know, I've read them and I remembered basically what he talked about. But there's things that, that I missed because of my lack of understanding 40 years ago, obviously didn't have the experience, uh, you know, when I was 20 years old to appreciate um, what Jones was talking about. Now I understand it a lot better. I mean, I was focused a bit more upon uh, the Sunday law part in the, in the first part of his, under, you know, trying to understand that. And then I did, um, was appreciating what he was saying about uh, righteousness by faith and how God is different from us, his ideas are different from our ideas. And this is something that I had learned a long time ago. And um, and it's the 1895 General Conference bulletins that address much more the nature of Christ, which was always the topic I was interested in. So the 1893 General Conference bulletins, I didn't, I didn't appreciate those ones as much. But I think now in what we've read, um, these things hit me a little bit harder, a little more clearly uh, than they did years ago. So we're going to begin reading. Now, remember, uh, you know, I know I'm reading um, and I'm going to make comments, but if people have uh, things that they want to say or things, verses they want to add or um, questions that they, they have, uh, this is a group study. So 
Um, I just find it's easier if I'm reading than if I have a bunch of different people reading. It's uh, um, a lot easier. It's a lot easier for people to watch the video um, where there's a consistent reading style. At least that's my view. For me personally, that's what I like. But anyway, we're going to go on and read. And um, Joan says, I wish we had six weeks in which to study the third angel's message now. Now, so it would have been probably, uh, I can't remember how long this uh, this was, um, but it was probably about three or four weeks. So, so he's not asking for, you know, a bunch more time. He just wants six weeks. And, and maybe he means six weeks from then. I'm not sure. The congregation responds, amen. He says, I mean, six weeks together, of course. We all have more than that separately. What I meant was that we might have six weeks together. And then we could begin to get a pretty good outline of the message for this time. But keeping what the Lord has given us and going from here with that, all that remains is to study the message and preach it. And it will grow as we do. And we will all see alike if we keep what we have received here and preach that. Now, when we think about how much studying we have done, I mean, since uh, April of 2020, so we're looking at basically, that's three years now that we've been studying together, uh, pretty much on a daily basis. And we learned, we've learned a lot of things, and we've unlearned a, a lot of things. And the one thing we know is that there is much more to learn than what we have learned. That is, the things that we need to still learn are greater than the things we've already learned. We know so little of God's word. And, and our mind can't even retain what we've already studied. And so sometimes I feel like, why do we continue to persist in this way? But it's not so much the things that we're learning. It's the time together. Because what is it that, about studying together that is so valuable? Well, two or three are gathered, you know, like it says. Okay, so Christ is in the midst, right? So Christ yeah. is with us. Um, we also sometimes are corrected by others. So it, it's important to, to recognize that we can sometimes be wrong about things well, more than sometimes. And we're not supposed to, um, let's how's the phrase go? So we're not supposed to deny ourselves fellowship. Yeah, we need to gather together. But we've been doing it pretty much daily, you know, for three years, which is, is and we were doing like three hour studies back during the pan pandemic when it started. Now we just do an hour and a half um, um, in the mornings and then, you know, these other studies on the weekend. But, um, you know, when we think about it, what, what's really happening is, is the together. This is coming together. Now, this, this isn't quite as good as being in person. Um, you know, I can't see your faces. You know, sometimes you might want to say things. And, and I could see that on your face. If we were in person, I could say, oh, you know, Angela wants to say something. But it's kind of hard unless, you know. Angela types in something in the chat, but, but, but you know what I'm saying is being together fellowship is, is really important for the growth of our characters, the differences that we have in personality and experience and the, of the way that we perceive the world. And each person is, is extremely valu valuable. God uses people who often um, you know, don't assert themselves, uh, but God can use them in ways that, you know, the person who is more extroverted, uh, that God can't, the person who's sort of moves ahead. And, and so we need all these different people. Um, but, you know, Jones, of course, is, 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 is not particularly talking about that. But he is, right? Because, I mean, yes, we can study on our own. But the time together helps us to form a message. 
And that's what this movement has been figuring out, is what is the message that we can understand? Now, he says six weeks. You know, if we could just study together six weeks, we could we could get this message together so that we know uh, all that remains is to study the message and preach it, right? So if we could do that and we could keep that, then we could give this message. But in some ways, we don't really know what the message is. In some ways, Jones didn't either. So, so this is something where, you know, we really have to pay attention and really try to figure out what God is speaking to us right now regarding the message that he wants us to give. Jones goes on, he says, the time is so near past, though, now, and there's so much to be said before we separate, that about all we can do tonight is to touch just a few points that lead out from where we are in lines that we need to follow and which will be our guide henceforth. So I think about that the way that I teach my guitar students. I definitely can't teach them everything they need to know, but I can give them the basics of technique, uh, the basics of music theory, uh, teach them proper habits of study, um, being able to analyze things, and then they can go on on their own and continue to learn and grow. And in some ways, I mean, that's all we could ever do. Even if we had a hundred years to study together, we would just still be touching on the foundation of what these are, um, what, what it is that we're learning. And, and I like where he mentioned in lines that we need to follow and which will be our guide henceforth. So God has given us these lines. Now, I'm sure he's not particularly talking about it in that sense. But we know that we have these lines that have first given to, you know, at least in this time, to Jeff. And they developed in our understanding of them. And we need to follow those lines because they are going to guide us. That is, these lines are just past history. They're just the experiences of the past. And those experiences of the past tell us about the present and give light for our feet so that we can move forward into the future. But Jones says, let us turn to the 13th chapter of Revelation and begin with this evening, to begin with this evening, and study that passage of scripture that refers to the United States and see if we may know where in the prophecy the working of this power comes in to deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. I know that a good many are losing sight of what has been done by looking for something that they had decided must be done first. And while looking for that which they had decided must be done and neglecting to use that which has been done, they will still go on getting further and further from the light, still less and less prepared to meet any of these things, whether they have come or whether they are yet to come. So this is quite profound, especially in the context of what we have been studying. So let, let's look at what he's saying. So he's talking about the prophecy dealing with the Sunday law, right? And in that prophecy of the Sunday law, where we see this prophecy, there's this working of this power that comes in to deceive them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. So there is a deception that is prepared by Satan for God's people. And, and he says this, that the way that he describes this, I know that a good many are losing sight of what has been done by looking for something that they had decided must be done, done first. Um, now, he's not giving us a lot of detail here yet. But if we look at what he's talked about, about our ideas, and we think about what the church is looking for, or what Seventh-day Adventists, maybe the church isn't even looking for the Sunday law, but Seventh-day Adventists who are, we have a way in which we think things must unfold. But there's a deception there for us, because we aren't really following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
right? We're following our own ideas about what we think. And we're not using or we're neglecting to use that which has been done. So something has been done that God has done. But they're not going to use what God has given them. They're not going to accept the light that God has given them through um, the events that have unfolded. Instead, they're going to just follow their own ideas. So he says, now in the 13th and 14th verses is the statement of prophecy about the working of that power. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. From the connection in which this is placed, a good many have been writing to me and saying that all these things must come to pass before the image is made, that these workings and wonderful manifestations are the workings of spiritualism and are to persuade the people to make an image to the beast or image of the beast. It is important, therefore, for us to study the prophecy and see what it says and as much as possible what it does not say. Now let us begin with the 11th verse of the 13th chapter. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, um, and we need to keep in mind what this movement has been addressing as far as understanding this in relation to the Sunday law. Um, and part of that is the Trump prediction um, and the understanding that's basically there's a conflict of understandings regarding that. So we have um, people in the movement who believe that Trump's going to become president again. And then there's me who believes that that's not the case, that that's not prophetically what's going to happen. That is, they're looking for the Sunday law to come from Trump uh, very soon, where I may be appear to be giving a peace and safety message because I'm saying that, that we're not there yet, and it's not going to be Trump. So there's this conflict that we have. But we want to see what Jones says about this, because some of these issues will relate to what's happening now in our understanding of these things. <clears throat> um, when did he speak as a dragon? When he was coming up, congregation, no. When is it that he speaks as a dragon? Read the 15th verse. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That is, when he speaks as a dragon, that is when he speaks as a dragon. Is it? Congregation, yes. So we're going to agree with them, of course, on this point. Isn't it the image of the beast that speaks as a dragon? Congregation, yes. Was the image of the beast made when he was seen coming up? Congregation, no. When what, this beast was seen coming up out of the earth, was the image of the beast made? Congregation, no. Was he then speaking as a dragon? Congregation, no. Then all of that verse does not apply in the place where it is printed. That you may see this a little more plainly, turn to Testimony 32, page 208. This was printed in 1885, so 1885. Ellen White says, The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the current is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. Now, when we think about this, as, as this movement, we know that the pandemic is a type of the Sunday law. It, it has some of the characteristics of the Sunday law. But one thing it doesn't have is Sunday, right? We also see that the church um, 
cooperated with the state in enforcing um, the, the mandates of the state, right? And that's what's going to happen with the Sunday. The church will cooperate with the state in enforcing Sunday observance. That's very clear from the spirit of prophecy. Not all of the church, but the organization at least, and the ministers within the church, will be supporting this. And, and that's because the Sunday movement is concealing its the true issue. And we can see that, of course, even with what has happened with the pandemic, we can see that there is an underlying issue. And that issue we would understand as the image of the beast, that this is a mixture of church and state. It's not necessarily the Sunday law itself that's developing. And this has been going on for a long time. So, you know, we could look at, at the last few years and say, well, this is now the Sunday law. But 9-11, it happens too. People exchange uh, their freedom for safety. So we can see that this is developing behind the scenes, and it was going on in Jones Day as well. This has been going on for a long time. <clears throat> so we go on. Has that any reference to the two horns like a lamb? Congregation, yes. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon when it shall speak. That was written in 1885. He had not yet spoken. Is that correct, congregation? Yes. When he was seen coming up, when was he seen coming up, congregation, in 1798? He had two horns like a lamb. When he was seen coming up and has had them all the time, is that so, congregation? Yes. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian. But there is the prophecy. He spake as a dragon. And we have found by the connection that is in the image that speaks and causes that as many as will not worship the image of the beast shall be killed. That is the dragon voice. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. Then I say again that the 11th verse is not all fulfilled in the place where it stands in the prophecy, and in the order in which these things that it mentions are mentioned in the prophecy. The last expression of the 11th verse is not fulfilled until we reach the 15th verse. Let us read on, 12th verse. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, has this beast that was seen coming up out of the earth been exercising as yet all the power that the first beast before him did. Congregation, no. Has he compelled them that dwell on the earth to worship the first beast? Congregation, no. Is that verse then, that 12th verse, fulfilled until the time of the 15th verse? Congregation, no. Until the time after the image is made? Congregation, yes. Then those two verses of the prophecy are manifestly fulfilled in the order in which the statements are manifestly not fulfilled in the order in which the statements are set down. Is that so, congregation? Yes. The 13th verse, and he doeth wonders so that he maketh fire to come down from heaven on earth in the sight of man. Man, is that fulfilled before the image of the beast is made? Congregation, no. We all know who have read volume four that that is one of the last things that is ever done before Satan comes himself personally. You who have read volume four, so that's the 1884 um, Great Controversy, uh, know that. And you who have not read it, just read it and you will see that the things, you will see that the making of a fire of fire to come down from heaven is one of the last things that is done before Satan appears personally, if not the last in fact. Volume four does not say positively um, 
that this will be wrought before Satan appears personally or after, but taking the most extreme view possible of it, it is amongst those things that are carried on when the very powers of the satanic agencies are exerted to their full extent to deceive, if possible, the very elect. This miracle is wrought to prove to the children of God that they are wronged in keeping the Sabbath. This miracle is wrought as a deciding test, and it will be one of the very last things before the decree goes forth to put people to death, if not the very last before that. It will be one of the last. The contest will be between the powers of the earth and the Lord, between those who yield and obey the powers of the earth and those who obey the Lord. Now, Jones is presenting something that you don't commonly see in Adventist understanding. Where is he placing Satan's personation of Christ? Is he placing it before the close of probation? No, it looks like after the close. After. And he gets that from the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White's quite clear that Satan's personation of Christ does not come before the, before the close of probation. Now, what people do is they misunderstand what it means to deceive, if possible, the very elect. This is a rhetorical statement. Is it possible to deceive the very elect, according to this statement? No. No, because their probation has closed. They've been sealed. Their sins have been blotted out. They cannot bring them to remembrance, and yet they see in themselves no good thing, right? They can't be deceived. Satan's, Satan is trying to deceive them. And if Satan could deceive them, the whole plan of salvation would be lost, correct? correct? Because God said that they're righteous. And if those that God has declared righteous are shown not to be righteous, then God is not correct. And that's why Satan is seeking to deceive them. But it's not possible. Now we also know um, in reading uh, in some of our other studies, probably about two years ago, um, when we were looking at what Ellen White says about the scapegoat, remember that the scapegoat is Satan. And when are the sins placed upon the head of the scapegoat? When are they placed upon the head of Satan in the line of, 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 you know, what's coming in the future? When does that occur? Anybody know? Okay, so it would have to be after that deception or, or attempted deception. It happens at the close of probation. Oh. Once, what, what he's trying to do this is really describing the scapegoat is trying to get away, right? He's being led by a fit man into the wilderness. And Ellen White describes the, the goat as seeking to escape the hands of the fit man, which is Christ. And yeah, that's what's happening. That. So that's what's happening from the time that probation closes until Christ returns. And so Satan, if he could escape, then he would be victorious. But that escaping would occur if those that are declared as righteous turn from their righteousness. Because God has declared them as righteous. So his word is being tested by that final generation. That's the very elect. It's impossible to deceive them. Um, Jones goes on, this miracle is wrought to prove the children of God, to the children of God, that they are wrong in keeping the Sabbath. This miracle is wrought as a deciding test, and it will be one of the very last things before the decree goes forth to put people to death. So it's going to be connected with the death decree, if not the very last before that. It will be one of the last. The contest will be between the powers of the earth and the Lord, between those who yield and obey the powers of the earth and those who obey the Lord. 
Now, are these miracles all wrought openly and above board, distinctly as against the Lord? Is that what they pretend to do, congregation? No. Are they wrought by those who openly and professedly deny Jesus Christ, congregation? No. Who then? Those who profess themselves to be Christ, false Christians will arise and shall show great signs and wonders. This will be done by those who themselves profess that they are representatives of Jesus Christ and that Christ is with them and that God is the God of that side of the question. But it will be denied and it will be known that it is not so by those who know the Lord. But this challenge will be made. There was a contest once as to whether the Lord was God or whether the Son was God. Baal. The test which decided was decided the day amongst the people that Elijah was a man of God and that God was the true God and not the sun God, not Baal. That test was fire came down from heaven. Now that test comes again, but this time it will be done to deceive and it will be done by those who claim now to be Baals or rather those who really are Baal's servants, but profess that Baal is God which is Satan, of course, and they will present that challenge to you and me. Now, you say that the Bible is the word of God. You stand on that. Yes, sir. You say that God is your God. Yes, sir. And that the Sabbath ought to be kept because that is the sign of what God is to man and what Christ is to man. Yes, sir. That is the position exactly. Now, a test must put, was put once before which decided this question. That was the fire that came down from heaven that decided there that the Lord was the true God. Now, we offer you upon your own proposition today the same challenge. We say to you that we challenge you to this decision. We will give an open, fair challenge. We say to you now, if we are the men of God, if God is our God and not yours, if we are men of God, let fire come down from heaven upon the earth. And what then? fire comes he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men men will see it and it is done to decide this question to decide that they are the people of god that they are men of god and when the true people of god say that that is not the test that that does not prove anything then you see they will say well you go back to your own evidences you say you believe the bible you say that is your foundation, and you agree that that decided this question once. Yes, sir. But now, when we do the same thing, you deny that, that that is any decision at all. What is the use of reasoning anymore with such men as that? They will go back on the plainest evidence that they themselves say that they stand upon. What more should be done but to kill such people as that? You can't reason with them anymore. And the fate of the world, the plagues, the pestilences, and all these things are coming upon the people on account of your craze because you will not surrender or yield. You are stubborn. You have it in your own way. You, you will have it your own way anyway. Now, in order to save people whose lives are precious, the only thing we can do is put you out of the way. So we say... And you will see by reading that that is not done before the image of the beast is made. It is after that that it comes. Brethren, it is not only time for every one of us to read volume four, but to read it over and over and to know the situation of things as they are. It is time to read it, and we cannot afford not to read it. So then, the three verses which we have read, you yourselves see, they are not fulfilled in the order in which the statements are set down. Now, now he could be referring to volume four as just the 1888 Great Controversy. That is possible. Because um, uh, I know he sometimes did, just came into my mind now. But, but anyway, it's the, either the 1884 or the 1888 Great Controversy that he's talking about. Um, now, let us read on. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Let us read another passage now in the 19th chapter of Revelation, referring to the coming of the Lord, the 19th and 20th verses. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse 
and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. Someone told me the other day about another translation, speaking of that, and I do not know whether it is the revised version or some other that reads, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped the image. And uh, Elder D.T. Bordeaux, Bordeaux uh, he says, so reads the French. Um, Elder Jones goes on. The same thought is in this. That shows that then that the miracles, the deceiving miracles that are wrought, are done to deceive them that had the mark of the beast. But do men receive the mark of the beast before the image is made? Under the message and the responsibility which the message brings, are men held responsible for receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast before the image comes on and undertakes to compel them to do it? It's a rather long sentence. Um, so under the message and the responsibility which the message brings to men, brings our men, are men held responsible for receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast before the image comes on and undertakes to compel them to do it, right? So you're not under a, a responsibility under the message until the image of the beast is made, that is, you're not responsible. He says, no, because we found in our lesson here that until the image was made, there was a way of escape from the worship of the beast. The way was open for man to refuse. But after the image is made, there's no way open for a man to refuse to worship the beast because there is no place on the earth where the power of the beast is not found. Consequently, after that comes there is no escape anymore. And then it is that men become responsible for worshiping either the beast or his image. There's no other way of escape. The only way is to turn to God then. Then the time comes that the decision is clear cut and must be made between God and the powers of the earth alone. Again, read the 16th chapter of Revelation. There the plagues, you know, are threatened to come upon the people because of worshiping the beast and his image. Under the sixth plague, we read verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of what? Doesn't it read this way? I saw three clean, unclean spirits, unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and deceived into making the false prophet congregation no. What is the false prophet, in other words, congregation? The two-horned beast. The image of the beast is the false prophet because that verse in the 19th chapter tells it. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. In the 13th chapter, we read, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him in his sight, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Then, what is the false prophet? The image of the beast. Now, then these spirits, they are the spirits of devils. The next verse, Revelation 16, 14 says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into, unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. But these spirits of devils working miracles come from where? They come from certain places to do these miracles. That is the truth, isn't it? And they come from those places to gather the people to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. These spirits of devils come at that time with this miracle working power. In this miracle working power, in this miracle working way, to do a certain thing. Where do they come from? The beast and the false prophet, or the image of the beast, 
then from those testimonies and from those two verses, isn't it plain that the deceiving miracles, the great miracles that are wrought to deceive men come after the image is made and not to make the image? Congregation, yes. Well, let us see whether we are right. Testimony 32, page 207. To secure popularity and patronage, legislators will yield to the demand for Sunday law. Will they? They have done it. Is that fulfilled, congregation? Yes, that has been fulfilled. They have done it, and they have done it so certainly that they themselves have publicly said that they did do it for that purpose. The evidence, more than we have had at any other time, is in this little pamphlet, The Captivity of the Republic. It is a report of the hearing before the committee on the World's Fair Sunday Closing Bill, an account of which I gave here in my second talk. This is now being printed and coming from the press. It is entitled The Captivity of the Republic. And the idea is that the churches have captured the Republic and hold it in the captivity in which they have taken it. And the quotations there from congressmen themselves lately, not simply those of Hiscock and Hawley and those of last summer, but those of the very latest members of the committee, which heard our arguments and refused to hear what they would not hear willingly, but which they had to hear. Statements from these very men saying that they must not go any further in that direction for fear of the damage to the fair and the country at large that the church element would do. You have it over and over there in several different ways. So there is further evidence than that which we had last summer. But they kept on saying that they did it then for that reason, and they still maintain it for the same reason. So that is fulfilled over and over, if anybody wants evidence on that point. Now, we need to address some other point here. So one of the things that we we understand is that we have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. So the false prophet makes an image to the beast. That is, it... it, uh, it itself becomes the image of the beast, right? This is some, some other thing apart from it. It's the same thing. And we had this discussion. So on December 25th, 2021, Colin presents his understanding, which I believe came from God in connecting Daniel chapter 11, verse 1 to 4, Daniel chapter 2, and Revelation 17 together. Now, in doing this, I believe he was led of God, but I believe he came to a wrong conclusion. And and the wrong conclusion is not because Colin is, you know, evil or bad or anything like that. Um, It's just simply he didn't know what we knew about the lines. Now, Colin did admit and did understand that January 6th, 2021, is the globalists taking over the United States. And we know, of course, and we struggled with it, but we know that the Republicans need to defeat the globalists in order for them to bring in the Sunday law. That the globalists want to control, but they're not interested in the Sunday. They will go along with the Sunday because... They want to have power. And of course, the Republicans want to have power. But who's going to have the power in the end? Who ends up sitting upon the throne of the earth under the Sunday law? Satan? Well, the papacy, right? Yeah. Because we know the papacy is placed upon the throne of the earth. We see that in connection with um, 508 and 538. France puts the papacy on the throne of the earth and France takes it, takes it down. And we can see that um, these powers that are at odds with each other, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, they have different goals. But yet they have to come together with a common goal. And the Sunday is going to be um, the test that's connected to that. They will all see it as expedient for their own reasons. 
And so we can see that you can't have, you can't have the way that we've looked at this Sunday law, the type of the Sunday law, the pandemic, that's a type of it, is that it was, it was a united effort of pretty much everyone. Now there's always people, churches, individuals that didn't go along with it. But we know that the vast majority of organizations did. That the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet were united in the actions that were done. So this, this uniting of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet at the end is, um, and we don't have time to go into this whole study right now, but one of the things I do want to bring out is that when we looked at Revelation chapter 17, we've understood it in this movement in a particular way. So when we look at the eighth head, who would we say that the eighth head is? Who would we say in this movement that the eighth head is? Wrong. But the papacy. Right, we, say, we say it's the papacy, right? That's what this movement is taught. But when we looked back at the pioneers, Joseph Bates and others, who did they recognize that the eighth head was? The eighth head is the image of the beast, right? It's the United States, not the papacy. And there's still things we have to understand about that. Because in this, here, we'll just go there. So I didn't really want to make it a study on this. But when we look at Revelation 17, remember, there's three different beasts that are described. You have the great red dragon. You have the beast of Revelation 13. And you have this um, other uh, beast you want to put it it's the scarlet colored beast you have the composite beast of course of chapter 13 and and the great red dragon of chapter 12 and they're not the same power right because chapter 12 it's pagan rome right the crowns are upon the heads chapter 13 the crowns are upon the 10 horns and in chapter 17 there is no crowns Right. We can see that the woman is not involved in Revelation chapter 12, but the woman is involved in Revelation 13. And that. But that or I shouldn't say the woman, but it is the papacy that's involved in Revelation 13. So we know that the Revelation 12. It's primarily Satan is the great red dragon, but secondarily, it's pagan Rome. Revelation 13 is the papacy. Right? That's what we see on the charts. But in Revelation 17, the woman is not the beast. The woman is riding the beast. And we still haven't fully understood what these heads then mean. Now, we know in chapter 12, the pioneers look at the heads as the different forms of government. And they continue with that idea all the way through. And one of the heads is the Republican form of government. And the Republican form of government is the United States being the eighth head. But the United States is also, or Republicanism is one of those heads as well. So it, it shows up twice. This is seems contrary to what we have taught. But if we understand it correctly, we will see that there's a reason why we see things a certain way and how to understand that we the one lack of understanding had to do with these heads. 
but that's that's for another study. The main point that I want to to note is that Jones is doing the same thing that Bates did, though he's not doing as it explicitly because he's not addressing Revelation 17. But Bates is very clear that the eighth head is the image of the beast. It is the United States. And, and when you put Revelation 13 and 17 together, and you see that what Revelation 17 do is doing is illustrating Revelation 13. But it's illustrating it at the end of the world where Revelation 13 is addressing the history at the time that the papacy rises. This is addressing modern Rome. So this is something that we have to study more thoroughly together. And, and me and Colin need to study these things out together with other people around, of course. Because there's, there's things that are being missed. We've missed things. And, and so we need to understand these things more thoroughly. So, so this is what Jones is talking about. What he's saying is in agreement with what we have understood once we understood what the pioneers were teaching regarding the image of the beast. <clears throat> okay, th um, this is a quote here um, from Ellen White. Those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates a precept of the Decalogue. Does this institution, Jones now is speaking, that has been set up by those men to secure popularity and patronage refer to en in any way to a precept of the Decalogue? Congregation, yes. Did they mention any precept of the Decalogue in the doing of it, congregation? Yes. Those who fear God cannot accept it. Do you hear that, congregation? Amen. Those who fear God cannot accept an institution that violates the precept of the Decalogue. And an institution that so entirely violates a precept of the Decalogue that it itself could not be set up by the government without taking the precept of the Decalogue out of the way altering it entirely. It is not set aside, set alongside of the other one. They did not enact any Sunday laws on its own merits, but they deliberately set up the precept of God and took out of it what he put into it and put into it what the Catholic Church set up in the place of it. On this battlefield comes the last great conflict of the controversy between truth and error. The battle is joined, and we are to go from this conference into the midst of it. And we are not left in doubt as to the issue. Now, as in the days of Mordecai, Mordecai the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God. Our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. Now, of course, um, we just passed March 7th. So we know that March 7th, 321 AD is um, uh, the Sunday law that's brought in by Rome. But we also know that March 7th in 473 BC is the decree um, of of um, Haman's decree, right, goes into effect on March 7th, 473 BC, on the 13th day of the 12th month in the 12th year of um, uh, Xerxes, right? So is that clear to everyone? We understand that? Okay, so so here we, we know that this this Sunday law, it's not a Sunday law, right, in 473 BC, but it is a Sunday law. That is, it is a type of the Sunday law. But it's not about the Sunday, right? It's a decree, you know, 
In a sense, it's, well, it's literally a death decree, not in a sense. I'm just trying to find the chart I have here. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll show you the chart here. So this chart here has um, the casting of the lots. So this is going to be, of course, they start on the first day of the first month, April 5th, 7, 474 BC. And then they issue this decree because they cast lots till they come to the 13th day, of the 12th month as how they cast these lots. And then three days later, uh, we're going to have um, the 16th day, right? So this is um, not going to go into that right now. Then you're going to have the hanging of uh, Haman. Mordecai is honored and Haman's hanged on the 17th day of the first month. 66 days later, Esther's decree is given in response to Haman's decree. That's going to be the 23rd day of the third month. And there's 323 days from uh, this period of three days after Esther finishes fasting to the decree going into effect. And then that's gonna be June 25th on uh, the Julian calendar. And that's gonna be 256 days from here to March 7th, right? So we can see the decree goes into effect. This is in the 12th year of Xerxes. So we had gone through and studied this in detail, all the chronology of, of the book of Esther, okay? <clears throat> So we have this Ellen White statement that Jones presents uh, that we're familiar with, right? So we know that what happened here is, is a parallel. So she says, now as in the days of Mordecai, the Lord will vindicate his truth and his people by the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. So Jones goes on, he says, now another thing, I want to ask you whether it has been fulfilled. When Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, that is when she shall, in 1884, so he is talking about the 1884 great controversy, it said she will. This says when she will, that little special testimony when it came a year ago now said, she is reaching, she is doing it. We know now that she has done it, don't we? Let us read from testimony number 33, page 240. So you can see here this parallel in Jones, Jones Day in 1893, 1892, even in 1884, you can see that this Sunday law is developing and it, and it parallels our time. The mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in 1892. Joan says it did. And he's correct, but he's on a different line. This is part of the development of something that happens in a time in which the first, second, and third angels' messages are rejected. Right? But it still parallels our day in which the first, second, and third angels' messages are proclaimed again. When our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. Now, remember, we look at our history, Ronald Reagan joins hands with the papacy to overthrow the Soviet Union, right? But we don't take the position that that work is complete, right? We know that really the joining of the hands, it, it, it's, they're reaching their hands, 
but it's when the Sunday law comes that the hands are joined. But they have also joined them, in a sense, earlier. So Jones goes on, but they joined hands with Popery in the doing of it in order to do it. And is it not all true in that one thing? She has joined hands with the papacy. That is fulfilled then, is it? Congregation, yes. Then the testimony is fulfilled down that far. Is that so? Right? So Jones is taking the position that in what they did, in changing, uh, taking the principles of the papacy's ideas of the Sunday law and attaching it to this uh, bill dealing with the Chicago World's Fair, that that was joining the hands with the papacy. And it is true that it is, but it's not really true that it is in the complete sense. But Jones doesn't know this, right? Because he doesn't realize where he is in these lines. But he's still right as far as the type, just as the pandemic is the type of the Sunday law. Okay. <clears throat> He says, then further, the same paragraph here on page 240 of the testimony number 33. When our nation shall show abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with Popery. It will be nothing else than giving life to the tyranny, which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again into active despotism. Jones goes on, we have found by our other studies and by the latest testimonies that have come that it is through the influence of the United States government that all the nations are brought back to the papacy. And when that is done, it is through this country that life is given to that same tyrannical spirit which passes all over the world. So then we are up to that point now, are we? Congregation, yes. Now, I, I just want to point out something that, that maybe we haven't thought of, but Ellen White, when she first talks about a Sunday law, she only talks about a Sunday law that happens after the close of probation in connection with the death decree. She doesn't come to talk about the Sunday law prior to the close of probation until basically in this history. That is the understanding of the Sunday law in the Adventist church and re as revealed through the spirit of prophecy um, is unfolded progressively. That is, they didn't, they didn't, when they first had the idea of the Sunday law, they didn't have this Sunday law in the United States prior to, to the close of probation. They only had the Sunday law after the close of probation. They didn't have, in a sense, the national Sunday law. And, and these ideas are still relatively new to Adventists at this time. I mean, we've known about these for a long time, this idea. But what you see in the Great Controversy is, in a sense, a relatively new idea that came into Adventism at that time. Okay, so... Um, so then he's going to go on here. Now, let us see what remains. There's something else to come in this connection. On page 207 of Testimonies, number 32, we read, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism. It is fulfilled up to that point, up to the last one now. Is it? Congregation, yes. The other remains. So this is something that we, I don't know if we fully understand this yet of what's happening, because we know. Now, it is interesting that Ellen White, when she mentions this, a one, one time she will say that they, they reach across the gulf to grasp hands with the Roman power and across the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism. And then the other time she actually switches it around. They reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and and reach across the, whatever's the word there, um, uh, to, to grasp hands uh, with, with um, spiritualism, right? So she switches it around, however she words it. Um, 
So she talks about this threefold union. And, and that's where we are not to yet. Now we can see that these reachings and these graspings and claspings have occurred off and on. But all these powers are still fighting against each other. But it's the United States that brings together globalism or spiritualism with the papacy. The United States becomes this united, united power. It is fulfilled up to that point, up to that last one now, is it? Congregation, yes, the other remains. When she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influences of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. When they joined hands with popery, it was to set up the papal institution as the testimony which had been printed in the bulletin told us that God's memorial has been set aside. The false Sabbath has been put in its place. In the doing of that, she has joined hands with popery, has set up the institution of the papacy instead of the institution of God. That much is fulfilled then. That was accomplished in joining hands with popery. Now, the next thing is to join hands with spiritualism. And then, under the influence of this threefold union, every principle, not only as a Protestant, but as a Republican government, goes. Now, a Republican government is a government of the people, not monarchical. What is the object of Satan in working all these miracles? Well, I shall read the rest of this, that sentence first. When under the influence of the threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusion, then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. Now, why is it and for what purpose is it that Satan does these miraculous things? Isn't it to prove that he is Christ? Congregation, yes. False Christ shall arise and shall show great signs and wonders, if possible to, de to deceive the very elect. But he puts himself in the place of Christ. Christ is king, isn't he? Congregation, yes. When Satan, in those miracles, puts himself in the place of Christ, it is to be the same thing, is it? congregation yes when this is done then upon the very face of it every principle of republican government has been taken away and they will have a monarchy established and so the object of spiritualism is to open the way for the professed coming of christ and the setting up of his kingdom of uh, the earth now we can see here that jones doesn't know some things that we know are they going to be setting up a monarchy? Well, that's a kind of what it implies, doesn't it? Well, what, what we know is it's, it's going to be a tyranny, but a monarchy is, you know, run by a succession, you know, an individual family. Um, and so I don't think Jones can quite see communism yet. Mm. Right. So really what happens is that in this rejection of Republican government, they still, and, and of course, a repudiation of, of Protestantism, right? And we know the Protestant horn had a, a partial fall in 1844, right? Yeah, we, they were lost uh, to probation, right? Or 40, that was 42, well, I think. Though. Well, yeah, well, in 42, they closed the doors, but but they really fail on, on the first day of the first month. Protestant Protestantism fails when the second angel arrives, right? And then, then the Millerites are tested. But, um, but the point here is that they receive a partial fall in that history, but that it's going to be a, a complete fall at the end. Right. So that fall occurred. They became part of Babylon. 
but that wasn't that wasn't the the completion of it that wasn't the perfect fulfillment of it if we wanted to call it that because the sins continue to pile up protestantism at the present time is very unprotestant in almost every single way possible i mean they're woke aren't they that's what it seems that's what i see they they definitely are not protestant and they also accept much that we see with the globalists and with the 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 whole woke thing but we know that somehow these things are all going to come together we don't know how but we know that um somehow that um the globalists are going to be defeated in a sense, but they're defeated by grasping hands with the United States. That is, they join hands with the United States, but they also are defeated in some way as well. We don't fully understand it at this point. At least I don't. Um, so I don't think a monarchy is going to be established, but what we will have is a tyranny. And many of the people who speak against globalism now, because of its tyrannical sort of um, ambitions, you know, if you're going to use the WEF as an example of that, uh, their ambitions, um, they will support the tyranny when it goes along with their ideas, even though now they oppose the tyranny. That is, people who are talking about freedom and the Constitution will easily set that aside in order to defeat, in their minds, the globalists. But really, haven't they just exchanged republicanism for globalism? Was that a question? Yeah. What Isn't it, that what's going to happen? What, there? It's what it seems. I mean, it's, that's the way it's appearing that it's heading. Yeah. How exactly that happens and how it unfolds, we don't know. But we do know that the United States is going to be united with what we call the globalists, with spiritualism. And it will also be united with the papacy. It's the United States that unite these other two powers that are definitely at odds with each other, right? The papacy is definitely at odds with spiritualism because they want to be in control under their ideas. And that's why I've never bought into the, the conspiracy theories that they're all just the same thing and they're all controlled at the top. They actually are enemies of each other. Soviet Union was not papal. It was spiritualism. It's a completely different power. Atheistic in every way. So, anyway, we'll see how things unfold. But what we can say is that this can't be about uh, a monarchy. <clears throat> now, why is it and for what purpose is it that Satan does these miraculous things? Isn't it to prove that he is Christ, right? So we go on and we look at this, that there's these false Christs that shall arise, shall show great signs and wonders, if possible, to deceive the very elect. But he puts himself in the place of Christ. Christ is king, isn't he, congregation? Yes. When Satan, in those miracles, puts himself in the place of Christ, it is to be the same thing, is it, congregation? Yes. When this is done, then, Upon the very face of it, every principle of Republican government has been taken away, and they will have a monarchy established. Now, of course, we're going to say it's not a monarchy. It's going to be some kind of, you know, neo-socialist um, 
thing because it's a very strange mixture uh this this new um breed of of communism because it's 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 postmodern it's quite different from what we saw you know with the rise of the soviet union but and i'm not sure i fully understand it and so the object of spiritualism is to or the globalism is to open the way for the professed coming of christ and the setting up of his kingdom uh, on the earth so you see having done so much already it is easy enough to take the next step and to recognize christ as king that is the thing that is being urged now by the national reformers who have been working for that which they have obtained by those who recognize the strength of what has been done in making this a Christian nation. This will be done in much the same way. The principle will be recognized in some way, and they will clasp uh, hands with spiritualism. Then when, when that is done, when the way is opened, Christ is recognized, Christ in quotation marks, is recognized as king. That opens the way for Satan to come as Christ, and set up his kingdom here and do all these miracles and sweep the world with him. And then the cry is raised. Volume four gives it. Christ has come. Christ has come. And does not all this show to us that the working of Satan in spiritualism, in these wonders and miracles that deceive men, is after the making of the image, even as the prophecy says, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the number of his name. Then you can see again that up to the 15th verse, not one of the verses is fulfilled in the order in which the statements are set down. Well, then says one, what in the world is that that way for? How are we to know then when it does come? Well, volume four tells you that too. It says this on page 443. To learn what the image is like, and how it is to be formed, we must study the characteristics of the beast itself, the papacy. And this, this is a, a statement in spirit prophecy we're all familiar with, I'm sure. But we probably haven't really thought what that means, because we probably haven't really followed it. This movement has to some degree, because we understand how the papacy was formed. Okay. We are to learn of the fulfillment of the prophecy and be able to detect that from our knowledge of the thing of which it is an image. In other words, we are not to get the knowledge of the fulfillment of this prophecy from the prophecy itself alone, but we are to detect and to learn of the fulfillment of this prophecy from the record of the nature, the working, and the disposition of the beast of which there this is only an image. So you see, in order to see when these passages are fulfilled, in order to see when they are met, we must be acquainted with the beast and well acquainted with it, that any one of these points appear, we can see where that belongs, because we know that we know where it belonged in the original. And then, knowing where it belongs, we can avoid that thing. There is a peculiarity about this prophecy that is not about many others. There are some prophecies like the prophecy of Daniel, seventh chapter, the passing away of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and so on. Those prophecies, men could see the fulfillment of them in the event, and they could be perfectly safe in it. In other words, was, was it safe for men acquainted with the scriptures to look for another kingdom to succeed Babylon and to look for it as Medo-Persia and know when that thing was fulfilled from the event itself? Yes. And they could see it fulfilled and the event itself. But mark you, here is this prophecy that comes at the end of the world 
And in the world of events that bring the end of the world and the man who waits to see this fulfilled in order to act, he will be too late. So what he's saying is we can't wait to see the Sunday law be fulfilled to, to decide then, right? We can't, we can't look for its fulfillment after the fact and then see that it was fulfilled unless we understood it before. So we have to understand it before. We can't, we can't wait till after to look at it and say, oh, this was fulfilled. This is what we expected. It's going to come in a way that we don't expect. Therefore, this is a prophecy with which God wants us to be so well acquainted beforehand that we will look at it from the right side and not be behind when it does come. And in order to do that, you see the Lord gives us a picture that has already been wrought out in history. He gives the course of events that have already been carried out, fulfilled before the eyes of men in a slow process, so that in studying it, as it occurred slowly in that, we can become thoroughly acquainted with the principles that were established and their outgrowth and the result of them. And he does that in order that we may be so well acquainted with those things in all their bearings, that when the first hint of those things is touched here, we may know the outcome of it long beforehand, and therefore have ample time to take warning, never get caught. And this is why the Lord does not want us to look for the fulfillment of this prophecy in the prophecy itself, because if we wait for that, the most important things in the fulfillment of the prophecy will be those things upon which depends our salvation at the very moment that that thing is fulfilled. And if we are on the wrong side, if we are late, um, we are simply left. Therefore, he fixes it and has fixed it so as to show us the beast in its fullness, in all his working, in order that by studying that, we may be able to detect the image in every phase and on every side. The first hint of anything of the kind is enough because we know what the thing is. Everything is in it. And therefore, just as soon as that thing is touched, we can say, that means the image of the beast. The image of the beast is in that thing. And I must avoid every connection of it or with it from now until the end of the world. Watching the growth of that thing which has been started, which I know was the spirit and principle of the papacy when it was started. When I see that and avoid all of it at every step, I am on safe ground. And unless I do that, I am on dangerous ground. So Jones is you know, presenting this in a particular way because he's trying to have us, he's trying to tell us something without stepping on our toes. Right, so that we can consider it. But one thing that this is not, when it comes to the end time prophecies, we can't say time will tell. We can't say wait and see. Because we are actually acting out the spirit of the papacy ourselves. That the image of the beast test is more about character than anything else. It's not, and, and, and it's not about what's going to come. It's about what has happened and have we learned the lessons of the past. Or are we going to do the same thing? Because if we haven't learned those lessons of the past and we do the same thing, we'll end up in the same place as those who are on the wrong side of the issue. <clears throat> and Jones is giving us the way to understand this. And that's what this movement has done, has studied the past. We study the past so we can understand the present. He goes on, therefore the spirit of prophecy has told us that if we would know about the image, we must study the original, the beast. And those who are watching it in this way will be able to detect the evil thing in every one of its phases. No difference how it comes up or where it comes up, even if it will only be the merest glimmer. And God wants us to be so well acquainted with the original that we can detect the image, even though it 
be only a glimmer. So you can see what he's getting at here. We don't know where it's going to come up, how it's going to come up, but we need to know the principles behind the papacy. We need to see them, not just in others, not just in the events of history, but in ourselves. Brethren, these things are important for us to consider and for us to know that we should not be overcome so that we shall not be taken unawares on anything or at any point, but always be ahead in the thought and in the light of the spirit of God. So I say it over again. Um, okay. Well, so Rosanna made a comment here. There's a black Pope running the white Pope. Well, right now we have the black Pope is the white Pope. That's because correct. The black, right. Yeah. So. And that's just the Jesuits really run the Catholic Church. That's been my understanding. And so now we have a Jesuit for the first time, a Jesuit Pope. So Francis is a Jesuit, right? So, I mean, I know this thing of the black and white Pope from the past, but, but the reality is that the papacy is just not a Christian power. It, it is a political power. But the point I want to get to here is that knowing about all of these different things, you know, all of these different uh, groups and, and, and theories about, you know, who's behind what and what's going to happen in the World Economic Forum and, and what's happening with the Jesuits or the Illuminati or the Freemasons. Uh, Jeff, in uh, 2010, his first presentation at the Oklahoma camp meeting on the prophetic chain, he says that these things are not going to help us. And, and we can see here with Jones, if we, if we take what he's saying here, we need to understand these principles, not so much where or how it's going to happen, you know, the details of how this is going to unfold. And we think that if we know those things, if we watch what's happening, that somehow we can, we can sort of not be deceived. But this deception, I mean, these powers will rise and do their thing. How are we not going to be deceived? The only way that we cannot be deceived is to understand, first, we need to know Christ. We need to know the truth. But we also can learn from the past on how things were done in the past. And, and we need to understand those things on a line. We need to see how they fit into a reform line. Jones isn't, of course, saying this, but that's really what the only way that we can understand it is to understand the past in a structure, to see the principles involved. And that's what the lines are. They give us these principles, these way marks, where we can see how there's a period of darkness and there is what that darkness is and how it comes about. And there are counterfeit reform lines too. The papacy has its own reform lines. So, so we need to be converted, obviously, if we're going to pass this test. We need to be led by the spirit of God and not by the spirit of the world. So Jones says, so I say it over again, from the nature of things and in the fast world of these last days, these things all coming so fast, in order to be safe, we have got to be ahead of the actual occurrence of events. And in order to prepare us for that, God has drawn it slowly out before our eyes in the historical evidence of the beast. He has drawn that out so that we can study it at leisure. And in this study, as it occurred slowly, even up to the full development and ruin that was wrought by it before, we can see by the spirit of God enlightening us, Always be ahead of these things that are coming now, so that when they do come, however fast, we are only glad because we know beforehand what it all means. So this is what we understand about the lines. The light of the midnight cry shines all along the path to give light for our feet. 
but we don't see the end of the paths, path. We only see the light for our feet. As we pass over the ground of fulfilled prophecy, those events reflect upon the events of the past. And those events of the past shine light forward ahead of us on the path. So this is a very important principle. <clears throat> um, that is all I can say upon that particular line of prophecy or this particular passage. But I think that it is necessary, as so many questions have been asked upon that, to call attention to it before we separate. Now, let us sketch what is in the book of Revelation after that. The third angel's message warns against of the beast and his image and the danger of drinking the wine of the wrath of God. And then follows the coming of the Savior to reap the harvest of the earth and the people of God standing on Mount Zion. So there, that is a sketch through from where we are to the final victory. Um, you can just see how much we got left here. I know there's quite a bit more. So I think we're going to stop there now. Yeah. So we're going to have to read this. Um, whoops. Okay. So this is where we're going to pick up next Friday. So it's going to be at the top of page 401. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a lot of information. Um, of course, I've sent out these, uh, if people want to study this more closely, uh, I've sent out Jones, uh, this document. Any final thoughts before we close? I'm sorry, what did you say you sent? This document, people have this document. Oh, yeah, I hear that. I'm reading it now. Yeah, so you can... People can look at the document if they want to go over some of these things again. Um, but yeah, there's still there's still so much. The more I studied this, uh, how much there is that we we think we know that we need to unlearn, and things that we still need to learn that we don't realize we don't know. Okay. Any thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Well, let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for these messages. We give our heart to you, our hearts, and our minds, and our bodies, and all that we have to your service. We ask you to come into our hearts and to um, that we can take the rubbish from the door to let Christ in, that he can do his work in cleansing us from all sin. We can cooperate with him in this work. And that we can re that we realize um, that the knowledge of what's going to happen is going to be meaningless if we don't know you. Be with each person. Be with us on the, the, the studies tomorrow. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.